causes you not to get to do something you normally would do with your money. It might even affect how you eat. It might even affect what you wear. Then that would be in the category, I think, of suffering for the Lord, having to rearrange some things in order to give to a cause that you believe is of God. These people are getting cut off financially. These people that are at Ephesus are being cut off socially. They're outcasts because of Jesus Christ. They pay a price for being a Christian. If you live for Christ in this culture, you can be an outcast. If you live for Christ in this culture, you can have people turn against you. Sometimes family, sometimes supposed to be friends, will reject you. So the Apostle Paul is suffering. He suffered for the cause of Christ. He gets beaten up. He gets thrown in jail. He gets ridiculed on every front. He wants the church at Ephesus to know that this is a good thing, that I'm suffering for this glorious gospel that I get to be a part of. So this morning, as you look at your life, if you're suffering for the cause of Christ, if you've got family that doesn't speak to you, or you've got people that's mad at you, and all you did is what you thought was right in the sight of the Lord, and you did it as kind and loving as you could, and you're paying the price, then God wants you to be encouraged. Now, you go home today after church, and it's Sunday, and you go, oh, wow, Monday's going to be here just in a few hours. I'm not ready. I got to get laundry done. I got to get some cooking done. I got all this stuff on me. I need to go to the store. I need to pay these bills. Oh, boy, it's all falling up. Here it comes. Here it gets all on me. Oh, what kind of deal could you cop? What kind of an attitude could you have? Where do you think you'd come from to try to display yourself in a Christ-like manner? Everybody in this room is under pressure. If you're not under pressure, I don't mean to be a pessimist, but if you're not under pressure right now, you will be soon. So what do you do? How do you act? What, what do you act like? When you walk up on a pile of something that's going to be unpleasant to move, whether that pile be a physical pile or whether that pile be an emotional pile, how do, how do you react? What, how do you react if somebody dies? Somebody you love dies. How do you react? If the money gets cut off and you didn't do anything wrong, you've been giving your money to the Lord and his causes, and all of a sudden they, they terminate your position at work. When you're standing by talking to other people as you're all departing the building, how do you talk compared to how they talk? Where are you at, really? So what I want to talk to you about this morning is the attitude of gratitude in the Christ life. I, I suffer there. In these last days, some of us say, why don't you smile? And so I have to think, man, am I not smiling at all? I used to think everything was funny. You know, I was never Chris Williams, but I thought a lot of stuff was funny. But what I'm saying is, where are you at on that? When you, when you got up this morning, did you go, oh, no, another day? Or did you go, wow, another opportunity? When you're running into a conflict, you're running into a, a place into a person. Do you reflect Christ in your general attitude? And then do you have joy? And if you had a pile of dishes to do because your family had all been there and seen you and you really enjoyed eating with them and being with them, if you're walking in the spirit, do you think you might wash that same pile of dishes that you could just grump about and go, how many plates can these people use? Or could it turn into a, I remember when I was eating these dumplings. I remember when the grandkids got a hold of this dessert. I really am in a good mood. Dear God, I'm going to sing some praise music to you while I wash these dishes. And maybe you get to going on and almost tear up or do tear up. And so the pile of dishes was nothing. It became secondary because Christ was primary. Your focus was on Jesus. When you go to work and there's a bunch of stuff to shovel or Something to do is hard. Do you go, thank you, God, for giving me this job. Thank you, God, for letting me live in Christ. Thank you that this world is not very long. Thank you that I'm headed to heaven pretty soon forever and ever and ever, a world without end. So one time my buddy, a friend of mine, best buddy in high school and college, guy who stood up in our wedding, 
But his dad was always weaseling us. You ever been around anybody? He told him, he said, Rob, because we all called him Bob, but he called him Rob. And you knew when he said Rob, it was going to stink. And he said, Rob, I need you to come out and bring me. They paid me. And I need you to move some railroad ties, but you'll be done with everything I need you to do in a couple hours. And Bob had plans on that Saturday with his girlfriend, now his wife, of many years. And so we had to move these railroad ties. And they're big old creosoted railroad ties. They hadn't been used much, so they had their full weight. And he didn't have a few. He had. It looked like he must have stole everything the railroad ever had. And so we're moving those railroad ties, and Bob's beginning, and we, he wants them stacked, and he's, it's not far enough to haul them, so we're going to have to drag them and restack them. And so we're dragging railroad ties, and Bob's in a bad mood. And uh, Bob's throwing the railroad ties, and we were big and strong back in those days. So Bob would throw a railroad tie, he'd give it a sling, and the railroad tie would hit and bounce, and then he'd go straighten it up, and he's throwing, he's starting to take vengeance on his railroad ties. And he's throwing them harder than you have to throw on them. And then he's banging them down where they go. He's not hurting the railroad ties, you know. And his dad comes up after telling us every, every two hours, you're about done. Now I got so-and-so. You're about done. Now I got so-and-so. You're about done. Now I got so-and-so. Bob is pretty disgusted with his dad. But he's not said a word. He's just throwing railroad ties hard. And his dad said, I'll never forget, his dad said, Rob, Bob, it's, it's not your work, son. It's your attitude. And I've used that for years when somebody's doing more than you could expect them to do, straining their guts out, getting the job done. I love to walk up and say, it's not your work. It's your attitude. As a joke. But it's not a joke sometimes, is it? Sometimes we do stuff and we got such an attitude. And you'll, ta you'll tell a kid, you ever have a kid get all puffed? I had a granddaughter who we took with us to see our son yesterday. And so she could play with the other granddaughter, a cousin. And when it was time to go, the granddaughters are puffed. Why? Why now? Oh, how are you doing? Oh, you know. uh, girls are a little more dramatic than boys. Uh, my observation, I never had girls to raise, but, but anyhow, they're going on. And then the granddaughter announces, the nine-year-old announces to the cousin uh, about, your, grandma says, we're going to try to get you to that birthday party too back in Illinois. I'll never get to do it now. There's no way I'm going to do anything when I get home. Oh. And I'm wanting to come off, you know. So she got to go see her cousin. She got to play as long as she could possibly play. And she got to the party, which was a long, big party, going to last for hours, just a little bit late. And so her attitude was not one for those moments of gratitude. Am I making any sense to you? As the, as the gift giver, as the grandpa, pawpaw, pop, whatever, I took her with me on my escape from life. I wanted to go somewhere and stay overnight and just get away from everything and all the stuff. And I add to it for her sake. And as the giver, I fed her. We took care of her. We watched her. We gave her fun stuff to do. We're trying to bless her with more blessings. And on the way from one blessing to another blessing, she cannot but get a bit, a bit of drama queen. Now, I wonder when our Heavenly Father looks at you and me. If he says, I'm trying to drag you from blessing to blessing, and even the bad stuff I let happen to you is for me to make you more like Jesus. I always intend good for you. I love you. I wonder if he says, well, we certainly are a bunch of drama queens. It's not your work, it's your attitude. So we'll turn around to a kid and we'll say, don't give, don't give me attitude. And we almost imply right away that attitude is always negative. But do we ever teach the other the flip side of the coin? If what somebody's displaying is a negative attitude, 
Is there any way they can have a positive attitude in the same set of circumstances? Not a positive attitude about when the circumstances get changed, but what if you're in Egypt for 400 years like the children of Israel? You're born in Egypt, you live in Egypt, you die in Egypt, your kids die in Egypt, your grandkids die in Egypt, you've never seen the promised land. You don't have any memories of the promised land before you left, and you don't have any expectation of getting to the promised land when you leave. Your job's to make bricks. Your job's to make stuff for pyramids. Your job's to do whatever Pharaoh tells you to do. Can you have a good attitude? Can you have joy in the midst of that kind of a situation? Can you enjoy life? So that's what I want to talk to you about today is can you enjoy life? An attitude is a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. Everybody who's been married at least 20 years that's sitting in here, uh, you ever get attitude? You ever get attitude? Come on, work with me. We all do, don't we? You want a glass of tea? No! What are you yelling about? I'm not yelling at you. Well, it seemed to be aimed right over here. But anyhow, attitude does not have to be negative. It's the settled way of thinking or feeling. You ever complain about God? Don't tell me you don't because every time you gripe about some condition about something, and to some degree it's a complaint about God saying, I don't know why you're letting this happen. Why don't you straighten this up? Why don't you do better about this? But anyhow, when you cop an attitude of positive, now, I, I need somebody to preach this so I can sit there with you while they tell us what to do, really. When you cop an attitude of a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, the someone being Christ, the something being life, could you cop an attitude of gratitude, and it's typically one that's reflected in a person's behavior, could we behave as happy Christians? Could you have a happy marriage if the other person didn't even really change? Could you have a happy life with kids that are knuckleheads? I enjoyed my granddaughter. I sucked back on my lecture. Because the only bad moment we had is walking out the door leaving. And she was the one having a bad moment. I can join in on it or I can blow it off for a minute and get in her car and then she's well. I have to decide whether I'm going to enjoy my granddaughter or whether I'm going to not enjoy my granddaughter. I have to make up my mind in that situation whether I'm going to leave with my heart loving my grandkids or whether I'm going to get a, I'm not doing this again. I'll tell you what, it'll be a long time before I do something stupid like this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying we don't discipline them. I'm not saying we don't say quit that. I, I gave her a lecture on what words mean last time she was around me. But the point is, do I in me internally, who I really am, reflected externally, do I love that God let me have kids and grandkids? And do I praise him for that? Or does my behavior reflect an old grump? who can't be satisfied with anything. Let's look at attitude. Or gratitude, rather. Gratitude is the quality of being thankful. How much would your life change if you were thankful in the morning? When you get up in the morning, did, did you have anything possible at your disposal to eat today? Let's say your cupboard was bare, the icebox didn't have anything in it because you didn't have time to shop. Did you have enough money to pick up a sandwich out of some window if you wanted one? Well, an attitude of gratitude would say, thank you, Lord, that I live in the land of milk and honey. Thank you, Lord, that if I can't get something decent to eat at home, I can go somewhere and get something to eat. Thank you, Lord, that I'll be able to resupply my shelves. 
Thank you, Lord, that I live in a country where if I can't stock my shelves, somebody will probably give me food. Between the churches and the government, somebody will probably give me something to eat. I'm not going to starve. Thank you, Lord, that I get the access to nutrition. You ever been thirsty where the water's no good? It'll change your whole attitude about life. I was thirsty in a place where there was no water. Mr. Genius here took coffee filters. I was going to boil my water instead of taking bottled water. <laughs> Moron. You know, there's got to be somewhere to boil it. Then it needs to cool before you pour it. It was not a good plan for me to boil water and pour it through strainers to get clean water. When I got home, I drunk out of a garden hose and it tasted like plastic. But boy, it was good because I had all of it I wanted. I stood here and drank like some stupid horse drinking too much just because I could. Still awake? Well, what verse are you going to get to, Brother Love? Point number one, humility in our attitude, appreciation, and in apprehending the Christ life. It requires humility to accept life circumstances in a joyful way. Verse 11 in Ephesians 3 says, This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. God accomplished. God realized. God established. All kinds of things in Christ. Now, I, I don't want to not emphasize redemption. There's nothing greater that God did in Christ than making a way for you and I to be saved. Amen? But that's not all he did. He wants the fact that he redeemed us, the fact that he loved us while we were yet sinners, to have practical application in our daily lives. It's not just about understanding the theological doctrinal emphasis of what it is to be saved, what it is to be redeemed, what it is to be chosen, what it is to be born again, what it is to have the Holy Spirit come and reside in your life. Those are all very, very, very important. But you can even understand that and be able to write it down and teach a class on it and not display the joy that that should bring in your daily life. So what are we talking about here? God's eternal will. So humility is, 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 is necessary to embrace God's eternal will, God's plan for your life and for this church. If we all had humility, we would go after what God, where God's working and we'd get in on it. The additions to this church, a lot of people don't even want because it's people 45, 50 years old and up People are coming to this church when they do come to this church and they're getting saved and they're past middle age. You say, well, they're not past middle age. Well, I, I'm 66. Somebody says, so you're middle aged? Not unless I'm going to live to be 120 something. So what I'm trying to say is though, do we get on what God's given us? Do we rejoice? Somebody rebuked me the other day. I was talking about my uh, being inept, I feel like I'm not getting the job done about the church growing. And they said, you're not even looking where God's using it. What about the people who have come and started growing and they're at everything? They're there every time you turn around. What, what, you know? So it made me go, wait a minute. Instead of crying that I'm not getting all kinds of, when we got up for children's church a while ago and two or three kids walked out, you know, and you go, oh, Oh, we got to reach young people. Let me give you a, a dumb statement. This is all, I'm drifting off, but hang with me just a minute. These young people are the future of this church. They're the future of the church, but probably not this one. Because most of the young people in Southern Illinois, the majority of them move away. The future has to be whatever it is in the moment. Now, if people grow up in Centralia and love Centralia and want to go to church in Centralia from the time they're a kid till the time they die, that's great. But where the reality 
that you better jump in on where God's moving when God's moving? Does that make sense? Not that you don't want to reach any young families. It's not what I'm saying. But why act like it doesn't matter when you reach older people? Why not bless God with an attitude of thank you, God, that we're reaching somebody? Thank you that we're making disciples out of the ones you give us. Thank you that we're not compromising on truth. Thank you that we're paying a price for it in some ways. So, dear God, wow, you count us worthy to handle your word. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. I'm supposed to be before him because he's had this plan of saving you and saving me before the foundation of the world. Does that humble you a little bit? To wrap your mind around, God sent his only begotten son to die for me, not only for all the things about salvation, but post-salvation for me to stand in your presence, blameless before you. Now, how am I blameless before God? Because I'm such a wonderful person, full of good works all the time. No, because the blood of Jesus Christ has given me access. And in that blood and in that access, I actually do some good works. And I don't have to dwell on the negative 24-7. Sometimes I can stand before God and go, it feels good just to be with you. And then being with you is so overwhelming that you're starting to affect my life. So I walked up to the buffet, and they were out of desserts. And I looked down to the buffet, and they only had a little chicken. And I looked down to the buffet, and they didn't have bow tie salad today. Well, life ain't worth living. Skip this place. I'm going to get on my blog or Facebook or whatever you get on. I never do it, but anyhow. Hey, the so-and-so restaurants are ripoff. They didn't have no bow tie salad. You know what I mean? I can only get 27 chicken legs today. It was quite a ripoff. You know, whatever. Or you could walk in there if you've been with the Lord and go, Dear Lord, what a blessing. What a blessing to live in the land of milk and honey. What a blessing that if they don't have enough for me to eat here, I can go eat somewhere else. What a blessing. Dear God, I'm so overwhelmed with how good you are. These other people look hungry. I'm going to let them go up there and wipe out the rest of it, and then I'll get in line. Because I can talk to you sitting over here at this table. I'm visiting with you in my heart and mind right now, talking to you, praising you. And you've, you're, you're letting me cop a good attitude. Anybody awake? Is this fairy tale stuff, or is this something that could happen in our life? The Apostle Paul is getting it. He's been beat up. He's been put in jail. He gets in trouble every time he tries to do what's right. And he's telling these people about this doctrinal stuff again. Why does he keep talking about all this deep theological stuff when he's trying to tell them, don't worry about me when you hear about what's happened to me. Don't let it get you down. That's what he says in the 13th verse. But why is he talking about this in the 11th verse? Why does he keep bringing up this doctrinal theological platitudes? Sometimes when you're preaching, people go, that's got nothing to do with my life. Oh, that's a sad story you just told. You have nothing to do with God in your life? Are you telling me you don't know anything about God? You don't dwell on his holiness? You don't dwell on his glory? You're not humble enough to know that he's the source of every aspect of your life? Is that what you're telling me? You want a how-to sermon so you get more money? Or do you want a truth sermon? Sermon, so you enjoy your God. Verse 11 of he, in Ephesians chapter 1 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance. My parents uh, didn't leave me much inheritance. I'm wondering if our boys are going to say that about us. Not much money. 
But my heavenly father left me inheritance. I'm joint heirs with Jesus. Are you saved today? You're joint heirs with Jesus. You're going to rule and reign with Christ forever. You think you got anything going on worth waiting for? In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him. A lot of people get worked up about that word. Oh, 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 uh, I, I'm, I'm offended by the word predestined. You missed the whole point of the passage. The whole point of the passage. Somehow or another, you got in. You don't like the word predestined? Use some other word. What I'm trying to tell you is, do you get the point that you're a child of God? Do you believe he called you out by name? Do you believe he gave you enough faith to place it in him and be converted? How many of you have called upon the name of the Lord and you knew you'd be saved and you were? Isn't that the whole big deal about everything? According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. You know why God let me go through what I go through? Because it's his plan. Now, sometimes I do stuff to myself and I pay for it. But what I'm talking about is overall, God's working his plan in your life. Do you have this confidence today? Work with me a minute. How many of you walked in this room today saying, God's at work in my life? He was at work in my life before I knew him. He was at work in my life when I got to know him, when I got saved. He's in my life since I got saved. The greatest blessing I could ever have is to know that God is in my life, whether I'm making bricks in Egypt or whether I'm living at the buffet. He's working with me. He wants me in on this. Now, we got a cop and attitude, positive or negative. Overall, what would you say yours is? And don't get mad at me. You'll, you'll prove what I'm talking about. <laughs> Overall, just inside your heart right now, with you and the Holy Spirit conversing, under the Word of God, do you have an overall positive attitude or an all, overall negative attitude? How many of you believe there's a lot of stuff in this society to get negative about? You can't just plug your ears up and go, I don't want to know, I don't want to know. All the nasty stuff, all the perversion in this culture, it's a reality. You've got to go ahead and deal with it. It's not even bad to talk about it and vent a little while. But what's your attitude? At the end of that conversation about all the horrific stuff going on in our land, do you say, but my master's coming back, and boy, is he going to straighten this up? Do you think we win? Or do you think we lose? If they're getting ready to cut your head off because you said, I will not denounce Christ, and they said, your head's going to be in a basket in about two minutes, would you say, well, you're just getting me a crown in heaven? You can't hurt me. You can make me endure pain, but you can't damage me eternally because I am in the hands of God. So when your loved one mouths you, does that ruin your whole day? Oh, it's a wasted day. Oh. Or do you go, I'm tired of listening to this mouth. I think I'll go outside. But while you're outside, do you say, dear God, you bless me so much. And even though I got people running around me all over the place, mouthing off, at least I'm not lonely. <laughs> Have you ever gotten where you're by yourself? Everybody who's ever thought I'd like to be alone. Have you ever been alone long enough that you go, I'm lonely? Well, when you do get it, one of these days, you're going to miss life. I'm not going to say you're not going to enjoy it. You can enjoy being alone. But being alone shouldn't be in a vacuum. It should be alone with God. Alone time with God, some of the best alone time there ever has been or ever will be. 
But if you don't have the right attitude, you'll blow it. When you get alone time, you'll cry about being alone and nobody loves me. If you cop a bad attitude and if you've copped a good attitude, you'd say, dear God, this is pleasant. It's just me and you. Make any sense to anybody? I've got you all to myself. You've got my full attention. Thank you for this window of opportunity. Instead of sulking about being alone, I'll rejoice about being with you. It's according to how you look at everything. Do you have an appreciation for Christ? I don't mean do you love him and you're glad he saved you. I don't mean overall that you say sometimes I'm thankful. I'm talking about do you appreciate him? Have you ever studied him? Do you ever dwell on him? Do you ever think about him? Do you ever pine away about him? Do you ever meditate upon the Lord? Have you ever tried to picture what God is like? Read your Bible and get your brain all inflamed. I'm going to see him one of these days. I'm going to see Jesus Christ because he won't burn my eyes out. He veiled himself with a body. I'm going to touch him. Someday I might get a chance to touch him. Or someday he might walk up and touch me. What about this? What if Jesus Christ just walked by you and laid his hand on your shoulder and said, my child, Is that any happy place for anybody in here? Well, if he does that through the Holy Spirit now, and even though he doesn't have fingers, but in your heart and your mind, he touches you. And you go, I am in the presence of the Almighty. I'm hooked up with God. Have you apprehended your purpose? Everybody in America just flies around. If you don't like this church, and you just want to go to a Baptist church, there's the other ones that are all pretty and nice. And if you don't like that one, there's another Baptist church within striking distance, even if you're limited to the Baptist. And if you're not limited by the Baptist, there's all kinds of places. I mean, there's just a crud load of places. Go in, sit down, go in, go, 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 whatever. But have you appre apprehended his purpose for your life? Are you married because of Christ? Do you decide to have a baby or not have a baby because of Christ? Do you take the job because of Christ? Do you walk away from situations because of Christ? Do you pick a church? Because of Christ? Because you say, I believe he's telling me to go here. I believe he wants me to serve here. Do you do everything according of his eternal purpose and consequence? Do you do proper activity and have proper actions? Anybody ever made a fool out of yourself letting people know how you feel? Come on. Anybody ever look, anybody, how many of you like to see yourself on film sometime when you go, I didn't say anything. And you go, well, 10,000 words with a red face. But other than that, this Jesus thing is supposed to be all consuming. Whether I got up and came here today, even as the preacher, should be based on Christ in my life. You know, I told him during a song service, if you don't help me, I got nothing to say. I just don't know what to say. I listened to a Doris Day song. I wasn't sitting in there playing praise music. I'll just tell you the truth. I listened to this Doris Day song, and it was all happy about love and life and wee. And then the stupid Alexa. I don't know why she does this to me. I just asked for that one song. It was kind of going through my mind, some lyric, and I couldn't remember who sung it when. And I just, I was waiting on Christy to get finished getting ready. And I said, Alexa, play so and so. I can't even remember what it is now. I can't, wish I could tell you. But man, the one they followed it up with with Judy Garland, I remember it. 
it was depressing. It was almost led to suicide. And I think she ended her life with suicide. And I, got, I said, when that song got done, I said, Alexa, stop. Because I'm trying to come to you and preach about attitude and the music that played across my stupid little speakers that blow you out of this church was about if that's all there is. And I thought, oh my gosh, is that all there is? Do you see how easily influenced we all are? You say only you're that easy influenced. Okay, but I'm willing to gamble that a lot of you are easily influenced too. Smell a smell, think a thought, hear a word, play a song, and wind up in a good attitude or a bad attitude. That's why we got to guard ourselves. Amen? And what should you dwell on while you're trying not to dwell on negative or terrible things? How about Christ? And then go back to regular life with a God attitude. Point number two, confidence about access and action in Christ. Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. You've got the ability to boldly access Christ. How many of you devils ever told you the way you've been acting and the way you got, you, you have no business coming before Christ? It's because he's a liar. When you got a bad attitude, you ain't work very happy, and you're kind of mean going on. That that's not a time to hide from Christ. That's a time to run to him. So should you come to him sheepish? Oh, dear God. Not according to the Bible. You're going to walk into the Holy of Holies. You can't do that backing up. And when you do that, you've got to approach the Almighty like this, Hebrews 4.14, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Why is Jesus able to sympathize with your weaknesses? But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted to have a bad attitude. He didn't get a bad attitude, but he got tempted to have a bad attitude. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted to lust or whatever and fail. Now, a lot of you don't understand words. I'm not going to preach a whole sermon to you on the difference in temptation and sin. Temptation comes at you. Sins when you indulge. Amen? Jesus has never indulged. But he knows what it's like to want to complain about being hungry. He knows what it's like to want to complain about, complain about being lonely. But you know what Jesus did every time he had spare time? He didn't complain about the disciples' lack of interest. He went and spent time with the Father. He's the author and finisher of our faith. I spend a lot of time whining about disciples. When I could, in my prayer time, focus on the glory of God, and then the disciples being good or bad wouldn't matter near as much. It matters, but it'd be put in perspective. Is that making sense to anybody? Work with me. I'll get you out of here sometime this month. But one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then, listen to this, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Let us then draw near with confidence in grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Anybody ever been needy? I'm needy right now. I need him to help me say what I got to say. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence 
to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Don't waste your confidence. You got access to the throne of God. You've been invited. You're not unwelcome. You are welcome at the throne of God in the holiest of the holy places by the blood of Jesus Christ. Could that give you a good attitude? Bold, spiritually aggressive, with urgency, awake, alert. Bring me the next slide, would you, brother? Bold, spiritually, spiritual aggressiveness, urgent, awake, alert. How do you go into the throne room of God with your head in a fog? That's why I limit the amount of drugs I'm going to take. How about you? Somebody said, what are you talking about? I'm not talking about, I don't buy anything off the street. What I'm talking about is I don't want a brain fog all the time. A little more pain and a lot more alert is better than no pain and half unconscious when you're trying to embrace God. You need to be able to say, I feel you, I know you, I'm, 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 I'm wrapping my mind around you. The realization of access and the opportunity is awesome privilege to comprehend. The realization. When's the last time you just slowed down a minute like we are this morning and said, I just want to realize who I am in Christ? It is good to be a child of the king. It is good. Confident faith in Christ, assured, attached, connection. <sighs> Bogey had to go to doggy care. The cat had to stay alone with food and water and everything she needed, you know, all of it. For one night, Romeo went to the son's, uh, the oldest son's house while we went to the younger son's house. Bogey doesn't know what's going on in those situations, and he sure is glad when he gets picked up. And he likes coming back home. That's me. I don't know what to do when I'm in some of the cages and the pens of life, but I sure do like it when the Father comes to get me or just visits me in jail. Access to the throne of God. Access. Faith is a verb. It's an activator, but faith is also a noun. It's about a foundational belief. Are you settled in Christ this morning? Do you know that you know that you know who you are in Christ? Third, last deals. Perspective about persecution. It's a weird sermon to preach in America because most Christians in America are not persecuted. The church in America is tempted and sometimes complying with the culture. Therefore, they don't hear from the culture. If the culture doesn't hate you, and if the culture doesn't hate your church, you're not Christ-like. Oh, if your stance on things, Jesus said, the world hated me, it will hate you also. He said, no servant's greater than his master. So if you get persecuted in Christ, for Christ, so what should you do? Paul said, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Paul said, I don't want you to get all downtrodden. If they threw somebody you love in jail for their stance on Christ, if your preacher gets thrown in jail for saying truth, and it kind of is a downer to you, I'm not going to address the people who go good. You in jail would be a great break. But hell, I'm trying to say, no, if you're, 
the Apostle Paul has been all kinds of turmoil and all kinds of tribulation. He said, don't lose heart. I'm telling you about these big theological doctrinal things so you'll get a hold of Christ and realize he's got a hold of you. Worship him. Have a good life. Have a good attitude. Be positive. Doesn't mean you never mention the negative. That's stupid. You'd be out of balance. But it's not your dwelling place. It's not your dwelling place. Keep courage. You can be disappointed without becoming despondent. Work with me a little bit and I'll get done. Everybody in here, you got told you should never be discouraged. What lollygagging world is that person living in? I'm just telling you, that's a joke. I'm never discouraged. Well, you're not in reality. But do you have to become despondent, lethargic, sedentary in your emotion? No. Can you still enjoy your grandkids while the world's wanting to kill your grandkids? Yeah, pull them in and get them tight. Amen? Hold them tight. Play with them a little bit. If you can't play with them, take them somewhere else they can play and you can just watch. But I'm saying enjoy the life you've been given. When you leave here in a little while and you go to lunch, Don't go, I couldn't find anything I wanted. Good, don't eat. Pray. Get good and hungry. Then that old peanut butter and jelly looks pretty stinking good, doesn't it? Amen? If your belly's burning, everything's good. Oh, a cabbage bar. (laughs) Me too. I got to quit talking about it. I got to end this sermon. Okay, we're dismissed. Sorry. No. Got to thinking about cabbage headed somewhere. Uh, glory in your tribulation. When it's about Christ, I told the truth. I said it nice, but I said it twice, and now I'm in trouble. Thank you, God, that your spirit is bearing witness with my spirit that I just did what you wanted and it is a good place to be. Suffering in your presence is better than glorying in your absence. Become more active in witnessing. That's about all there is to it, isn't it? Become more active in your witnessing. Philippians 1.14, and most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Did you know the more you get in trouble for talking about Jesus, the better you'll get about talking about Jesus? If you're really walking in the spirit, it won't cause you to stop, it'll cause you to go more. Your attitude of gratitude will carry you in to the hostilities of family and friends who think you're nuts about Jesus. Strangely encouraged. This Christian life's strange. That's why the church doesn't preach it. They don't want to be weird. If you're a born-again Christian and you really love Jesus, you're weird in this culture. Just get used to it. You're weird. Acts 5, 40. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them, charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ, that the Christ is Jesus. What we would see as an obstacle, they saw as an opportunity. They beat them up. And they said, wow, we've been counted worthy to suffer for Christ. Isn't that amazing? What kind of attitude's that? Been counted worthy. So, 
Let's live for Jesus. Let's live with Jesus. Let's be up in the midst of down. If you've never been saved, today would be the day to get saved. And if you are saved today, it would be a good day to tell it. To confess it. I don't care who does what to me, I belong to Jesus. And if you've got a bad attitude, this is an opportunity God gave you by having me be here and you be here and this word be here for you to say, you know what? A lot of it's just attitude. But you can't fake it. You can't do it in the flesh. You've got to crucify your flesh so that your spirit will soar. It'll change the way you talk. It'll change the way you see things. And for me, how many of you have to be crucified daily? Oh, that I might mature to that level instead of having to be crucified every half hour. Sometimes right after I get my flesh crucified, I don't make it 15 minutes and I'm right back where I started. I got to crucify it again. Amen? You say, I don't know what to do to get rid of this bad attitude. You're going to have to work with the Lord to have a good attitude because you can get up and be in a bad mood with no effort. No effort. But to get up and go about in a good mood requires walking in the Spirit. So as we sing this song, what would God have you do with this thing we call invitation? Dear God, here's your prayer. Dear God, what do you want me to talk to you about during this invitation? <laughs>